I put like $300 in that account and I scaled it up to 40,000. And this is a really important lesson. It's not, it's not a profit or a loss until you close the trade. So it doesn't matter if you have $1 million in that account, if it's unrealized because you have not closed that trade, take your partials. But a lot of people don't really grasp that trading is a real thing that you can make real money off of. Hello and welcome and thank you for joining in. Thank you. Thank y'all for having me. Yeah. I understand you had to wake up really early today. You're not, you're not tired at all? Yes, I'm tired, but I'm so used to running without sleep that it's become my normal. Okay, great. I mean, you don't look tired, so that that's fine. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yeah, Buzzy, why don't you start with telling us a little bit more about yourself aside from training? Like, what's your background? What Where did you start? Where did you educate yourself? Where did you go to school? Where did you work first? Stuff like that. Okay. So I'm one of those master of all trades people. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you name it, I've, I've just about done it because I'm just a very curious person, most definitely ADHD <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so I'm from Arkansas. My family is from Arkansas, rural Arkansas. My grandparents were cattle, cattle people. So I came up on 120 acres in the country. Mm. And after she had me and my siblings, she became an agency nurse. And so naturally I did follow in her footsteps. Me and my sister went to college in Arkansas and ran track together there because we ran track together also in high school. And I went from a bio biology major to nursing. Changed majors a couple times because like I said, I'm all over the place. Worked a thousand jobs. I, I used to work in the clubs a lot. So I was a cocktail server. <laughs> I was a bartender. I worked at a grocery store. I worked for a cleaning service. I did some of everything. And then I also joined the military. So yep. I did six years in the reserves as a ammo troop. So I was a bomb builder for ATNs and B-52s. We supported the fighter jets. Wow. And so that's where my name comes from. It flies over a lot of people's heads. But F-117 is actually a stealth fighter jet that you can't detect. It flies under the radar. So I've always been really fascinated with them ever since I, ever since I saw them. So, so I did that, pretty much used my military money to get through college. And once I got my nursing degree, I got out. And they were so happy to see me go because I was always a problem. I was always in trouble and always getting rolled up for insubordination. So there's that. So got my nursing degree and pretty much hit the ground running, became an agency slash travel nurse. Pretty much I would go into critical areas that nobody wanted to work and then I would just hound them. Like I would just work as many shifts as I could. I would work with multiple facilities, multiple places, and just my goal was to just to get as much experience as I could, like in as little time as possible and to just learn everything. So mm. I ended up working in psychiatric nursing, critical care. I did ICU nursing, concierge nursing, which is where I go to people's house and just do private pay treatments on them. I absolutely love that. Pediatric home health. So I've worked with like ventilator dependent babies. And that's kind of where I fell in love with nursing when I got off into critical care because it's, it's an adrenaline rush. Evidently, I like those sorts of things. So that's it for the most part. Did travel during the pandemic. That's where I got turned on to trading because during that time I got off into e-commerce, which was a goal of mine long term. Once I got that off the ground and running, then somebody who's from Arkansas who went to the same school that I ran track at, she was talking about it. and. Around, I want to say around July 2021, I signed up for her Discord. Mm. And I hadn't taken the course or anything. I just signed up and just kind of watched. Like I said, I'm a, like the stealth the stealth fighter jet. I'm, <laughs> I'm the type of person I kind of like to stand stand off in the, in the corner and just kind of see how things are going. And so I would pretty much just watch all the other girls trade. That's another thing is that because she was a travel nurse, the group was like 95% women, which is really unique. So uh, yes, it was all female traders in there. And so I would just kind of sit back and watch their daily trades and kind of figure out what the patterns were and the tendencies were. And I did that for about six or seven months. Mm -hmm. And then I finally signed up to take the course and I took my first trade. It was like, I want to say it was like Square slash Cash App and it cost like $30. And that was a big thing because it was just getting over the initial fear of just making the move, just doing it and just putting your money, there. putting your money, right? Right, right. So I, I understand paper trading, but I'm not going to lie. I'm the type of person that I have been trading real money from day one. Is it reckless? Yes, but I'm reckless. Wow. <laughs> so for me, trading real money helps me to me, it just seemed like a shortcut to being able to manage my emotions. And I think that's a huge deal in, in trading. Like you can have perfect strategy, but if you can't manage your emotions, then you won't be able to stick to that plan. So what was the first first emotion that was 
raging in you when you started trading live? Fear? No, it, it was excitement. <laughs> okay. Okay, but uh, yeah, the the fear didn't set in for me until way later, believe it or not. Like I'm very I was very oblivious to a lot of things and my fear didn't set in until like months, months down the line when I took my first big loss. That's when my trading psychology went in left field and it took me like a year and a half to recover that, believe it or not. And so uh, yeah, I was just really excited because Forex is one of those things like Forex and options. Those are the type of things you hear about, you see on TV, you see the trading rooms on TV, but to actually be a part of it, you know, in modern times doing it in a digital way is pretty dope. So for me, it just felt surreal because a lot of people talk about these things, but a lot of people don't really grasp that trading is a real thing that you can make real money off of. Everybody sees it as it's either a scam or it's not real or that's what the guys in the movies do, but we can never do that. So for me to just be in a part of it, even with my first little $30 trade, just felt really surreal. Wow. And uh, you mentioned your first big loss. How how big was it? Is it okay if you share it? Yes, yes. I don't mind. I'll, look, I'll talk about my losses all day <laughs> because they definitely shake me. It was on Tesla and I want to say it was about 35 to 40 grand. I can't complain because I had made that much. So I used to come in like heavy hitting, like with heavy hitting Tesla contracts. Matter of fact, in the group I was in, they called me Tessie Baby. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite. Yes. 35 to 40. Was it, what, did you blow your account at that point or? I don't think I blew it at that point. It took me like another two weeks to blow it because that scared me so bad that I started making bad trades. And I think that's kind of common after a loss is that you get really fearful and you lose your confidence. You'll just go down a down spiral of making bad trades so that didn't blow it but it definitely messed up my psychology where i kind of realized for the first time that i could lose and it was a weird ordeal where my signal kind of went out for a moment mm -hmm. and thank god for vpns and, and such now and being more prepared but my signal went out because i was trading in a hotel i was on a travel nurse contract in california and there was like a glitch and when i got my phone back online that money was gone wow. <laughs> yes that money was gone so or that particular trade. And so it wasn't one that I had bought a long contract, so I didn't have time to recover it. But even even then, speaking to trading psychology, my trading wasn't really according to my normal strategy because I was getting ready to wrap up that travel nurse contract. And I remember thinking like, I just want to take a break and go home for a little bit and just see my family. And so, whereas I used to just trade based on the charts and what I see and what setups I see, because now I had this goal, hey, I want to go home for a couple months and I still want to make the same money. Because a, a lot of y'all know like what travel nurses were making during the pandemic. It was $10,000 a week. And so in my mind, I was like, well, trade good for the next two weeks and you'll give yourself a break. But I wanted to make sure I could still make $10,000 a week trading before I took my vacation. So once I set that goal in mind, I was really forcing trades on the chart to try to meet that $10,000 a week, even though that wasn't according to my strategy or you know, for proper setups or quality setups. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really common mistake. So I think it's very, very dangerous to trade with a goal in mind. Like if I sit here today and say, oh, I want to have crab legs tonight and I want to get the biggest steak that they have. Mm -hmm. So let me try to make $400 real quick because, oh yeah, I want to pop a bottle too. Then I'm looking in the chart, like I'm forcing trades that are not there because my goal is the profit versus a quality setup. Yep. And so that, that was my first lesson in that and trading under pressure and trading with profit goals in mind versus trade in the chart okay that's i understand that we talked now about your first big loss is it possible we switch to to completely different part do you did you have like one of those moments this is something that i realize actually a lot of people that do succeed in trading do have these types of moments is when you think you made it but you didn't again did you ever get that moment when you think you made it and you got humbled so many times and i and i imagine i'll be humbled several more times if i'm being honest the fact that you can make money so quickly in trading you have to i, I say this a lot but like trading to me is is honestly like a spiritual experience like you have to humble yourself you have to get up every morning and meditate and make sure your mind is right before you hit those charts because anytime that i've tried to force trades or get on the charts when I know I wasn't in the right mind frame or that my emotions weren't intact, it reflected in my trading. Either I made impulsive moves or I forced trades or I stalled on my exits or I entered too soon. Whatever I'm feeling emotionally will reflect in a chart. It will. I will do that exact same thing on my chart. So if you don't have a routine like to get up in the morning and clear your mind and meditate and make sure you're in a clear headspace, you're going to continue to be humbled 
But uh, gosh, several times, I would say after that loss, I, I did rebuild my account and I did end up going home and taking a break and it was going good at first. And then I took another, it wasn't as big, but it was like very like, it was like a slow bleed. Like my account was slow bleeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, gosh, there's been several times I can say that actually has kind of led up to me changing my strategy and how I trade and take profits. Cause I used to just leave the money in my accounts. Like I was making money, a lot of money, but I would never make withdrawals cause I wanted to keep compounding the account. And there's nothing wrong with that. But now, like for example, let's say I put $500 in the account today and I scale it to 10,000. I'm going to take $5,000 off of that, right? Okay. That way, even if I lose the, the remaining 5000 I'm still in the money. I'm still profiting. So that's what that is. So now I probably, I probably like will skim my account every probably two days. I, I don't leave a ton. You know, I'll leave money in there, but I, I take profits off regularly, like every couple of days, just to make sure I'm not getting complacent because I know I can lose it. My my risk, my, my trading style can, can be risky at times. So I'd rather just yell my profits off and then know that I'm in a risk-free trade with whatever is remaining in the account, if that makes sense. Makes complete sense. Something that a lot of people actually have been talking on this auditorium, but you're, I, 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 when, I, when I talk to you, I realize now that it's not as easy, you know, just to say to yourself, take the profits. You, you understand that you can make even more. And when you're an enthusiastic person like yourself, it's not, it's not so easy to compound the broker account. I wanted to ask you, so you have you obviously been through a lot, ups and downs. And this, when you said, when we see your ups in the wins channel that you posted, like trades earning about $6,000 of one trade and, and stuff like that, and then losing on the other end, 35 to 40 K on one trade. What was, what would you say is the one thing you wish you had known? When you started, would you would you say that you would you wish you'd known something when you started trading, or you that you were in the same space like you didn't know anything you wanted to, this journey to start again? Yeah, I wouldn't change a thing if I could do it all over again. Uh, trading has been hell. Like trading has been the most difficult thing I've ever done in life, and I'm saying that as a critical care nurse who's worked 90 hours a week, and as a ammun ammunition strip who did manual labor. <laughs> Trading is far the hardest because it's you. You can't blame anybody. You have to be 100% accountable, and you have to be committed. And it's easy, in my opinion, for you to get up and do what your boss tells you to do, what your nine to five tells you to do, but to have that same respect for yourself and have that same discipline when it's just you is extremely difficult. So I wouldn't change it all over again. It's been a, a path of suffering, to be honest, to learn these lessons. But the that's the reason why they're etched into my brain is because I've had those pains. Heck, even like when I showed the, the wins last week, I also showed where I didn't exit my Bitcoin in time and, and probably left, I probably left $5,000 on the table and ended up having to leave that trade at break even because my exit was not was not sharp enough. You know, I didn't, I didn't exit that trade when I was supposed to. Even last month, believe it or not, I put like $300 in that account, you know, and I scaled it up to 40,000. So I only showed the, I think about seven or 8,000 profits that I pulled out, but that count actually scaled up to 40,000 from the 300. And then, uh, and this is a really important lesson. I had a really busy week. I drove back home. My brother had just paroled out of prison. I went to pick him up. We went shopping. We just hanging out. I'm super tired. I'm not sleeping. And I left for trade running and it basically went all the way up and wiped out. So I think, I think I lost about 20,000. Now, granted, I had already took out 10,000 in profits, but then it ran up to another, to another 20,000. Then I lost 20,000. Technically it wasn't a loss, but which, what do they say? Like, it's not, it's not a profit or a loss until you close the trade. So it doesn't matter if you have $1 million in that account, if it's unrealized because you have not closed that trade. <laughs> so take your partials, take your partials. And then uh, not only that, but I was breaking my trading rules. So one of my rules is that I don't trade when I'm tired or when I'm fatigued, I'm supposed to close my trades. I put a trailing stop on them before I go to sleep. And I didn't do that. So that's another thing. Every time I've ever lost money is because I did not follow my rules and mm -hmm. they're very, very basic, clear cut rules. And so uh, I like to draw the parallels between trading and nursing because a lot of my discipline honestly came from nursing, of course, in the military. And there's certain things that I had to do once I became a critical care nurse that I never had to do anywhere else. And you see this a lot with like medical professionals, like, you know, surgeons and stuff. I have to get up. So for one, I have to sleep. I can't go in and keep people alive for 12 hours if I haven't had any sleep because I can make the wrong call in a cold and that will cost somebody their life, correct? 
So yes. I have to make sure I sleep at least six to eight hours if I know I'm going to get up and be responsible for people's life for 12 hours. I have to have a routine. So I have to get up at least two to three hours before my shift just to get my brain awake. And then I drink my matcha tea. And then I get in the shower because I like the way the steam feels. And then I get out and I stretch. These are the things I do before I go into work with nursing, right? But when I first started trading, I noticed that I would like just roll out the bed and hit the charts. And it's like, I'm not even awake yet, right? So it's like, I realized that I have more respect for my employer than I have for myself because why am I not maintaining that same routine? Yep. So then I created another set of rules for myself that, hey, you can't hit that chart unless you've done your routine. You got to get up. You got to meditate. You got to drink your tea. You got to make sure you're fully alert before you hit those charts. You got to make sure you've had sleep. If you've only had two hours of sleep, then your, your decision making is not going to be clear. This is a book that I recommend. It's called The Art of Clear Decision Making. It was written by a fighter pilot in the, in the, in the U.S. Air Force. It has nothing to do with trading, but the book will have you on the edge sheet the whole time. And it tells you how he is able to make swift decisions under pressure. And I think that is 90% of trading because we all know if we're in a trending market and your trading is going well, that's, that's easy. But what happens when a trade reverses on you and you didn't expect it? You have to be able to think quickly on your feet. You're not going to be able to do that on two hours of sleep, right? Yeah. And you're not going to be able to do that if you just rolled out the bed and you haven't gotten yourself fully alert yet. So that's my advice as far as taking losses is once you have your set of rules, don't break them. If you give yourself 30 days of just following your rules and not breaking them, no matter how you feel or how excited you get about a setup, you'll be profitable. And I, I feel confident in that. I just wanted to mention something to the audience. I see people writing some stuff. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments and we'll get back to them at the end. I think that we can keep this flow now. Yeah, yeah I, I was meant to ask you about your routine because you mentioned a lot that uh, discipline plays an important role. And so this is, you know, basically what your typical typical day looks like if you're trading. So we, we covered all that part, how you started, how you came, where you came and w what works for you now. Do you have like set goals with your trading what what you're trying to achieve i do insofar i would like to scale back on my nursing which i've always been extremely passionate about but i want to pivot and see if i can kind of make an impact in other ways so uh, i want to scale back to working like you know maybe two days a month or something like that in critical care and that's actually why i was driving in this morning because i just switched over to a desk job so this is also another tip for people like if you're just starting out Routine is really important, and I don't mean just like getting up in the morning and having the same routine every morning, but also having like a set schedule. Because like for me, for example, because I'm an agency nurse, I work I work with probably at least over 30 hospitals, right? And that's not included outside of the state. So if I drive, you know, I'm, a, I'm an impulsive person, right? So I might get up today and say, I'm a road trip to Virginia. I can work when I get to Virginia and I can stop in Chicago and work. I can stop in Iowa and work. And I do that, right? Because I'm a hippie at heart. But it's not good for trading because with trading, you need to have an established daily routine and know like, okay, I mean, you should have an Excel spreadsheet showing like evidence of what works for you. Like, for example, my favorite pair to trade is AUD USD. And I like to trade it between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. So if I go and work a 3 to 11 shift today and then a 7A to 7P shift the next day and then I, I come in and float and take it for a couple hours on the next day, there's no way that I'm going to be making good decisions in my trading because you know what I'm saying? I'm not focused. I'm tired. One day I'm rested. The next day I'm not. So it's really important, if if possible, to have some sort of routine. So there's no there's no problem with working a nine to five or holding your nine to five. I know a lot of people will tell you to hurry up and quit your nine to five and become a full time trader. And that's great. And I get it just going all in. However, for me, and I can only speak for myself, nursing has afforded me the ability to be a high risk trader because I got a nursing check coming in every week. I can take whatever kind of risk I want to. And you know what I'm saying? I know there's people who left their nine to job really early, but they're very limited in what they can do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because they have they have so many things pulling out of the same pot, whereas I have like two or three pots to pull from. So for me, if I decide next week I want to change my strategy and go all in and just, you know, pedal to the metal and figure it out in a week, I, I can't afford to do that because I still do have my nine to five. However, what I can say is that working the same days each, each week, for example, has been helpful for me. So because the only thing open on the weekends is Bitcoin, I tend to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then that leaves me Monday through Thursday to just trade full time. You know, and that also gives me a sense of routine and it keeps me where I'm rested Monday through Thursday and then able to focus entirely on nursing on the weekends. 
that way I'm not, you know, watching the charts at work. So I shouldn't be doing that. But yeah, I get what you mean. So there's no risk management strategy to your trading at all, or <laughs> well, well, I do, I do have it, but there's times where there's times where I don't. Yeah, like I, I'll put it this way: like I, I know how to manage my risk. And I know when I'm in the casino, you know what I mean? Like, I know like when I'm, when I'm doing dumb stuff, just, you know, getting a dopamine hit, like that's, you know, that's almost like you need two separate accounts. I call it a, a casino account. That's you put a little play money in there. And if you just feel like doing something stupid, you go to your, your play account. And but when you want to use your, when you're trying to grow and compound, you go to your, to your actual account. If you want to try new strategies, for example, that you haven't thoroughly back tested, you might want to go to your casino account. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like I have it. It's just that, like, for example, when I started my e-commerce business again, because I had my nursing money coming in, I had unlimited room to figure out what worked for me to change my products, to change my website, to change my target demographic, to run, run my data analytics. Why? Because I have guaranteed income coming in with nursing. So it's not like I have to go and squeeze and force things to work with my e-commerce. I'm all about slow growth, I guess, in a sense. Or, you know, like I said, I always tell people, you know, you follow your heart and do what you think is best for you. But it's nothing shameful about, I guess, not being, quote unquote, a full time trader mm -hmm. and taking your time and getting there. There's nothing wrong with you trading and making money and then also having your nine to five and having two incomes until you figure it out. But I understand being a full time trader is the goal for a lot of people. So it is the it is the goal for me. But I, of course, want to have multiple streams of income. So one of my goals is to own a group home because I'm really passionate about mental health. That's working with psychotic kids. That's what a lot of my experience is working with psychotic adolescents and children. I also would like to have a nurse concierge. That's where you go and do preventative wellness for people and you just accept private pay. And these are things that I've done before in, in the past and I really enjoy. So trading yes but trading basically allows me to be the creative and to to live a more purposeful life because i can actually invest in things that i believe in versus right now you know working at the hospital i do as much as i can but it is a for-profit system and i have to deal with and you know maneuver through a lot of corruption on a day-to-day -day basis so trading is what the beautiful thing about trading for me is that it allows you to in my opinion to be your highest self because when you got two or three grand coming in a day you can use that money. If I want to go start a scholarship for nurses, you know, I can do that. And if I want to start a concierge and help people get into preventative wellness, I can do that. So there's a greater good to, to trading. It's not all about profits, 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 and then getting on a private jet and flexing on social media. Like yeah. I, I don't usually show my profits and I don't usually show the, you know, my material things because that's not really my personality. But overall, it's really great to be able to take that money and really invest it in things that you believe in. And that's what makes you want to wake up in the morning. And that's what, for me, keeps me motivated to keep trading. For me personally, I can't speak for everybody else. But I think that the main, main reason why you're thinking like that, when you say that trading doesn't have to be the main thing, and uh, when you sometimes can't afford y yourself to have like a casino account and a risk management account, I think that you're thinking that way because you always had big dreams and you always wanted to help a lot of people. And that's what made you force, I, I, I wouldn't say force, but it made you uh, think about other ways of having other ways of income and realizing that in order to not be stressed in trading you have to have those other sources of income and you wouldn't think like that if you were just thinking about getting the lifestyle most traders dream of yeah it's just my my personal i'm not i'm not trying to be a psychiatrist right now yeah you said that perfectly actually is is the pressure because i've i've done it before where i've taken three four months off work I mean, I've honestly always did this because, like I said, I'm a hippie at heart. So sometimes I'll just, I'll just, you know, come off the clock and I'll go travel for three or four months. Or sometimes I'll take six months off just to get my mind right. And before I started trading, that downtime was just for me to just relax and travel and experience things. But, and uh, people are probably looking at me crazy, like, how are you taking six months off work? Because I had a paid off Camry and no bills. I, I always live below my means. <laughs> so. So my income to, you know, my income to bill ratio was like nothing. But once I started trading, when I would take those months off, it was like, I felt this pressure. Like I need to make a thousand dollars a day. I need to make a thousand dollars a day. I need to make at least $500 a day. And I didn't like that feeling. So until you get to where you can do that comfortably, like until you get to where you can do these trades in your sleep and you can comfortably bring in whatever your target is without any pressure, I don't think it's a bad idea to have a backup. 
You know what I mean? But like I said, it wouldn't surprise me if I was trading full time within the next couple of months because I'm definitely transitioning into it now. But I'm saying this as a person who, you know, in my culture, like, you know, I've, you know, I'm a musician. I produce music like I've done so many things and I just see that reoccurring theme where people will shame you for having a nine to five. Or, you know, when I first started doing music, the big thing was, are you a full time, you know, creative or not? And you're only a real creative if you're a full time creative. When it's like nursing is the reason why I was able to create such top notch videos. I had like a practically unlimited budget. I would just go pick up an extra shift and then I get more props. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it was like there were there were positives to having that nine to five. And not only that, there's so many things that I learned from like the military and from nursing that has bled over into my trading. Undoubtedly, I don't think I would be a good trader if I hadn't first became a nurse. And so I, I just say it from a point of, yes, I think we all have the goal of being full-time traders, but also don't let anybody make you ashamed that you're not full-time yet. Because that's the first thing people will ask you if you tell them like, oh, you're a trader, they'll say, are you profitable yet? Or are you full-time yet? And they kind of say that to kind of mi minimize you, but just don't let that discourage you because, you know, I mean, I, I work with trust fund babies. They're up there for fun. You know, they, <laughs> they're punching the clock for fun. You know, just because you work, it doesn't mean anything about your success or your potential. It just means you're, you're playing it smart. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I love how you put that. That's so true. If, if you can take pressure off of yourself, then do it. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. I mean, in order to do that, you have to do a lot and you have to learn from doing a lot, learn a lot. And in order to do that, yeah, you have to just be enthusiastic and motivated like yourself. Is there a place where people can see your, you know, trading strategies, markups or something? Like post it on social media or to go over now? I mean, uh, can they follow you somewhere on social media? Oh, for sure. So I am Bazi Owens. So B-A-Z then underscore Owens. That's O-W-E-N-Z. All platforms. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. But I also have a creator page on Facebook that's under my government name, which is Shade Walker. So spelled S-A-D-E, last name Walker. And that's probably where I post that the most. But yeah, I do post. I am going to start posting more trading content. Thanks to y'all. Because I really was, like I said, I'm a very low-key person. It kind of flies under the radar. But somebody in here kind of encouraged me to share some markups. And I did that. And I appreciate the, the, those words of encouragement. That's really nice. It's been a long time since I've actually been active in a Discord community. So I really did appreciate that, that feedback. So, well, yeah, shout out, Walker. Well, if, it's, if you're going to start posting trading content soon, why don't we get a sneak preview if you can share some knowledge with us? Doesn't have to, doesn't have to last, last a long time. I just now realized we, we've been talking for like half an hour and it flew past like it was two minutes. Yeah. Okay, let me share my screen and go to a chart. And y'all, my, my strategy is so basic. Now, before we do this, I will say, that I am a note taker. I know you have like the physical, like the digital journals, but I still am very old school. I write everything. You know, sometimes I notice that, you know, there's a weakness or something that I have or my psychology is off. I'll write that down in the journal. Or if I notice a new possible setup, I'll write those rules down and then I'll just start to play with it. So I, I do write a lot of stuff down, like as I'm creating new strategies and learning how to trade in more market conditions. But I actually even created a checklist. I can I can post that on my social media, too, because the checklist I made was pretty was pretty nice. But let me share my screen and make sure y'all can see it. Can you see that? I can see it. OK, well, so this is my guys. You, yes, can, this you can see it. Just please comment in this in the section. Click click on the screen and it will open up and maximize. Yes, Cupcake says she can see it. Okay, yeah, so great. Me to click it. It's, it's all good. We can see everything. Okay, so this is my favorite pair, AUD, USD. This is on the 15 minute time frame, which is pretty much a default for me. I think the 15 minute is a sweet spot for everything. Of course, when you first start your day, you want to do top down analysis or pre market. So if you trade from eight to nine, you really kind of want to be up at five or six doing your pre market. I like to do my pre market data and then I go and cook myself breakfast. Like I'll go make some pork chops or something while I'm waiting for everything to warm up. <laughs> and then, so here we'll go to the four hour that load. And I'll go to the daily also because those daily setups are huge. So I'll go here and I'll see what the daily looks like. So for example, here we're clearly. We're clearly down and then i'll try to see if i can identify any trade on this from here and i do color code i think a lot of people do this i color code my time frames so i might draw a blue line here on the daily and then i'll change the thickness of it to a fourth point that lets me know that it's a large time frame i also tend to make my larger time frames really bright colors because they're like red flags like 
if you come across a trend line on daily time frame, you need to be very, very careful. So I usually make it like red or something. Then from the daily, I'll go down to the four hour. And I mean, I use very basic supply and demand, support and resistance. And I also want to share something else with y'all about price action here at the end of it. So here we are on the four hour. We see that your line is a little steeper. Then I'll go to the one hour and see if I see anything. I'll make a new trend line, just kind of defining this. Change the size of it to a lighter color, make it smaller. And then I'll go through and start looking for structural differences like wicks and stuff. So like here, anytime you see the candles touching and bouncing off in the area, that's either a support or resistance zone. So I'll put one there, change the color. So I know that this is a sensitive area or area of interest. And one of my rules is that anytime I come across an area of interest, I go ahead and close my trade and I re-enter with confirmation. And I'll try to show you what that means. I always look at where my wicks are because that tells me that there's liquidity there, that there was a liquidity grab. And I also have a tendency to go back and see what time my wicks formed on my chart. And they usually, of course, correlate with news, but sometimes they are random. So a trade like this, to be honest, on the hourly, we're in a downtrend. I would just draw a line here and take note of that wick right there. And then I will zoom in again to the 15 minute and I define my trades on the five minute. So something like this, for example, this is kind of where my head would be. I will be waiting for this candle to come back up and touch this trend line. And then I will be looking for a short but this would be more of a scalp day. So we all love trending days because you can be a really lazy trader. You can just enter your trade and just leave it running and add size at each retracement. I mean, it's beautiful. But on days like this, these are a little more tricky. This is what I call scalping days because although we are in a downtrend, we're so close to this area of interest that I would be looking to get out of these trades quickly, if that makes sense. So I'll be waiting for it to come back up and hit this trend line. I'll be sitting, I'm, a, I'm in favor of really wide stops because I think there's a lot of fake outs. There's a lot of liquidity grabs in the market. So I will probably be setting my stop like way up here and I'll be targeting like a one to one or a one to two, but I will be looking to put a, a take profit right here and then if we beat this level, I would enter again and play it to the downside. But if we started bouncing off of this level and getting a bunch of wicks right here, then I would be looking to come back in and play the reverse. The reversals are really, really tricky and they really kind of dangerous. In my opinion, Al Brooks is a really, really great trading guy. He talks about them. But usually if I trade a reversal, I'll drop my risk amount. So let's say I was going to trade five lots right here, you know, on the on the trend, I will probably drop it to half the size trading a reversal because it has such a high failure rate. But they usually pay out really big. Like reversals are usually like one to tens, whereas trends are usually like one to threes or one to fours. So it's just math. It's really just basic math. Probability, you're just looking for an edge. If we beat that level, then we would be back bearish. I would be looking to go long right here i will go in short again like somewhere like right here this would then this previous support level would then i'm sorry this previous demand level would flip and become a support or i'm saying that backwards resistance and then i would enter again right here with this being my resistance so i would set my stop loss above it so that's pretty much all it is is playing off areas of interest and knowing that okay usually when we see this pattern it does this it's really basic math when we see it, it typically does we see a it typically does b we have a lot of long wicks bouncing off this trend line. So, oh, yeah, I don't know if y'all hear that thunder. So when we get near this trend line again, we're looking to go up. And that's really all it is. Really, really basic supply and demand. I do have some like more refined strategies that I use for myself, like liquidity grabs and liquidity pools. Whenever I see, I actually have an alarm set. So whenever I see like a 1% change that happens within like 10 minutes, that's a cue to me that there's been a liquidity grab. Like, so for example, right here, you see how you got this really long wick, like it dropped all the way down and they came up. That would let me know like, okay, they just went and liquidated all the people who had trades, who had been trading along this trend. They just went down and grabbed them. So now that they've grabbed all those trades and they've, they've tried to liquidate our accounts, now we would go back in and trade in the direction that it's intending to go. And see, that would have played out. That would have played out one to four if you left it running. Even with a wide stop loss, that would have played out. So I would say everything I do is pretty basic. It just is just being patient and waiting for those simple setups to come. You can trade more complex setups. And then there's also price action. I'll say this and then I'll wrap it up. I know we've been here for a while. But so, you know, how I said I used to produce music, right? So something that I did as a music producer is I've always played by ear. Like I can read a little bit of music, but I've always played by ear, right? I've never been able to explain how I could do that. All I know is if you give me a piano or any instrument, I can figure out how to play it because 
my brain recognizes patterns really easily. And there's a lot of people who are like that, especially traders. And so like when I first started trading, I had no strategy. I did not understand supply and demand at all, but I was profitable because I was trading bar for bar price action. And I learned later, thanks to Al Brooks, that that's what I was doing. But basically just looking and seeing how the candle reacts when it gets to certain levels, how they're shaped, how the formations are around each other. Do you have a doji? Do you have a cross? Do you have a trend? And I could just trade that even without marking up market structure. And I kind of look at it, like I said, it's like playing the piano by ear. You can actually get on the charts and look at price action and play that, but preferably you'll get on here in the morning and mark up your charts. Usually if I know there's a supplier demand zone, I'll mark it with a box because you have range there. And I'm making this quick. There's a lot more detail that is, but I'm just making a quick explanation. So you'll mark your supply and demand zones like that. You'll color code them and then you'll mark your trend lines and you'll color code those. And then you'll know where your areas of interest are is where you need to be placing your trades or closing and exiting your trades. So that's pretty much the gist of it. And then, like I said, along with your market structure, you still should be paying attention to price action. So if you see like we're in a trend and we're going down, your market structure tells we're going down. But if you get right here and your candle starts stalling and it stalls for four bars, then you need to get out. That's what price action is. It's saying, well, go ahead and get out. Even though the trend is down, the price action is showing us that we're meeting a new level of resistance our new demand zone is forming. So go ahead and exit and wait for more information. That's something that I say to myself a lot. If you get in and you're ready to make money because you're ready to go splurge on crab legs tonight, don't ever hesitate to stop and say, I don't have enough information to make this trade. So I'm going to wait. Go take a walk. Go exercise. Go draw. Go call your ex and be toxic. Do whatever you want to do. But just make sure you... You just kill some time until you have enough information to enter a trade. I think that's also one of the biggest things. If it doesn't make sense, then don't trade it. I look at these charts a lot of times kind of like heart rhythms in, in nursing. And there's one in particular called V-Fib where it just looks like a, a toddler is scribbling on the monitor. That is a fatal rhythm. If you, you know, a person goes in that rhythm, they are pretty much, you know, they don't have a pulse, they're dead. And I look at trading the same way. If you go look at your chart, I'm going to try to find one real quick. Like you get in here and you see a bunch of noise and you don't see a trend and you don't see support or resistance that you don't have a pulse. That's not that's not tradable. If it's not tradable, leave it alone. Like I said, go be toxic and call your ex. Tell them you want your family back, whatever. Just go go kill a couple hours time until you have more information. You give it a couple hours and then, it, you know, a trend line develops. And now you say, OK, now I have enough information to make a trade that has a competitive edge. Once you have a competitive edge, you're good. All you need, you know, you're already 50-50 when you place a trade. All you need is a little bit of information that pulls that trade in your favor and you can be profitable. Well, I have to say, Bazi, I think that I, I'd love to hear you speak, but maybe we can wrap it up now. Yeah, yeah, it's been, thank you. Thank you so much for opening up your charts and showing us how you do it. But I think for the, maybe we could uh, leave the people wanting more for the next session and give it a little bit more details in it. I would just like, if you have time, to kind of go over the questions that people left. We have so much comments. I uh, can't see them, actually. How do I see them? It's in the top right corner if you click on the little chat icon. Okay. But we have a lot, a lot of people just agreeing with you while you were talking about your journey. And I believe maybe I can find some questions. Thank you, Kelly. Where do you post your markups? I haven't been posting them because I got in trouble on Facebook and got demonetized, but I'm going to start posting them on my, let's say I can't post them on TikTok. I can post them on my Instagram and I can post them on my Facebook. So oh. Sade Walker or Walker Sade, you could follow me there and I'll start posting them. And I also do post them in here too in the different channels sometimes. I'm going to now send a link to your Instagram. Maybe that's for the best. Okay. Does she not look for news? I don't trade news unless I just feel like gambling. I'm, I'm sure people, ha yeah, I'm sure people have their, like if you're a, a fundamental trader and you use fundamental analysis, then that's great. But I'm not going to lie. I don't understand fundamental analysis and it doesn't work for me. And like I said, if you ever follow Al Brooks, he doesn't believe in trading news because he believes that the market has already set itself up before the news came out to go in that direction. So like if I just feel like gambling and I want a dopamine hit, I'll throw something in a side account and trade the news. But uh, I don't trade news. No, I, I don't. I sent a link. I believe that this is the one, right? Which one? Let me see. It's in the chat, in the comment section. Oh, in the comment section? I'm missing. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. That's my Instagram. Okay. Great. Yeah. Walker. Yeah. See, uh, the Walker Sade is on Facebook. I post a lot there too. 
But yeah, I'll post them in the group also. Like I said, I appreciate y'all for all the encouragement and being polite. All trading groups aren't polite. So I do appreciate y'all. Okay, Janine, I hope I'm hope saying that right. You said you've heard of the art of clear decision making. Thank you. And if y'all can listen to the audiobook version, I promise you, you'll, you'll finish it in one day because it's like you're really in the, in the plane with this man. It's really good sound effects. Could you remind everybody what's the name of the book? The Art of Clear Decision Making. Pull it up real quick. Really, really good. And there's some other good trading books that I liked, uh, like Trading in the Zone. What's the one? The Playbook. That one was really good. But it's Hazard Lee, if I'm saying that right. That's how it looks. It's not a good picture, but... The Art yeah. of Clear Making. Yeah, that's a really, really, really good one. Okay. The Art of Clear Decision Making by Hazard Lee. And it'll help you to kind of manage your emotions and... Basically, to turn off your feelings when your trade reverses or does something you didn't expect and stick to your trading plan. That book has been just as helpful to me as the trading books, to be honest. And it talks a lot about how when you get scared, your IQ drops like 30 points automatically. <laughs> so you have to have a plan. You have to have a concrete plan. Yeah, KLT4X or Kings of Transparency, I think is what they call. That's who I use. And y'all, I love them. That's why I haven't had any problems with any of my payouts. They'll pay me out in like 15 minutes. Like if I request a payout, most of the time it's been in 15 minutes. The longest I've ever had to wait is two hours. But on the website, it says three business days. But don't believe that. We'll get it quick. GBP, JPY instead. I'll do some GBP markup. So I ain't going to lie. GBP, I like more so for, I kind of like for scalping because it's very volatile. And I don't really trade long term. I, I'll hold a trade over like two two or three days if I'm in a trend. If it's in a trending market. But that's another big thing, y'all, is identify your market conditions when you first start your day so you don't get clapped. <laughs> like you need to sit and look at your chart and say, are we trending? Are we ranging? Are we consolidating? Or are we volatile? Your trading strategy will probably be different depending on the conditions. Because like I said, sometimes I scalp and sometimes I just add size and just hold for, for 24 hours. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Thank you, Kelly. That was good. <laughs> Is it? Let me scroll up because I missed these. I did not realize there was a chat box. I'm so sorry. I'm, sorry. So, I'm learning. That's okay. I believe that we covered most of the. I see. I see you read. Uh, went through all the comments. People really relating and uh, being happy that you joined us today. So once again, I'm going to say thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It was. It was really like I said. It. It flew. Time flew past me. I, I think we were. We are here nearly for an hour. And I, yes. I was sitting here for 10 minutes. So it was great talking to you. And I hope to see Thank you again you. here. And I can't wait to get this recording out on YouTube and Instagram or everywhere else. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all for linking up with me. And I'll catch up with y'all later. Okay. Have a good day. Get some rest. And guys, see you tomorrow when we have Angel, the funded trader. His name on Discord is DGA Trades. See you guys.